I've come to an annual esports tournament in Hong Kong where gamers from all around the world have gathered to battle in four tournaments. We're not just a bunch of bros drinking beer and playing Mario Kart in a basement. Twelve international college and university teams are vying for bragging rights and monetary rewards. When you're a program that's prestigious as ours, you need to make sure you stay on top. During the festival, I'm meeting players and fans to see how this fast-growing sector is becoming a billion-dollar industry. Electronic sports, or esports, is competitive video gaming at a professional level, and every year its audience is growing by the tens of millions. 454 million people are expected to watch an esports event this year, and with total esports revenues expected to hit $1.1 billion in 2019, it's no surprise that new multi-million dollar esports arenas are popping up around the globe, including here in Hong Kong. I've come to Asia's largest esports complex, which was launched earlier this year, and it's open for gamers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Let's go take a look. The 25,000 square foot complex includes training facilities and a competition arena for up to 80 players. The Cyber Games Arena, which costs $3.8 million to build, is expected to attract 1.2 million visitors annually. That's where I meet Andrew Smith. The competitive gamer has come to Hong Kong with his esports team from Maryville University in St. Louis, Missouri to compete in the International College Cup. He'll be playing League of Legends. It's a multiplayer battle arena game made by Riot Games, which was acquired by Chinese tech giant Tencent. And just like any professional athlete, you need your equipment. I'm kind of a person that will use one thing until it pretty much doesn't work anymore. The essentials are really uh, your headset, your mouse, uh, your keyboard, and pretty much just a mouse pad. Beyond that, you're kind of you're getting in the extra territory. But those, <laughs> those four are the, the real crucial ones. It's not just gaming publishers capitalizing off the esports boom. Companies like Logitech, Dell, and even IKEA are rushing to get a piece of the market. Andrew gives me a crash course in League of Legends. Yeah, so you're not doing very hot right now. They're actually killing you and you're about to die. You can see your health bar is getting low. I quickly realized this game is much more complex than the Mario racing games I've been used to. This game has a very, very, very steep learning curve. And that's why it takes thousands of hours. Having just arrived in Asia after a 16 hour journey, Andrew is jet lagged, yet eager to compete at the upcoming tournament. It's a crazy thing, you know, to say you're going over, overseas across the world, right, to play video games. When I say I'm going to play League of Legends, they're like, oh, what are, what are you doing? But then when I say I'm going to Hong Kong, they all say, whoa, you can go to Hong Kong by playing computer games. I played soccer, uh, but what I really enjoyed doing when I was a kid was, was playing video games. But it's not just the professionals logging hours on their favorite games, the fans are too. I love to play this game. About three to four hours every day. Every day? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Three hours? Four. Four hours? Okay, and do your parents get mad? Yes. They don't like me playing games. As a younger kid, I, I definitely had my troubles in school, right? And I, I spent a lot of time playing video games when I shouldn't have. But for Andrew, playing video games for 10 to 12 hours a day paid off, literally. Andrew received a full scholarship to attend Maryville University, where he joined the school's eSports team. It's officially under the university's athletics department. Being a head coach is kind of one of those jobs you never really clock out of. Tanner Deegan is the full-time head coach for the eSports team at Maryville. Even when I go home, it's something you're always thinking about. The price you pay, you know, when you, when you have that responsibility, you're kind of never really turning it off. And with game day quick approaching, the pressure is on. I've come backstage of this weekend's main competition, and as you can see, this is a full-blown event. You have green rooms for the MC, for the commentators, and then you have multiple rooms for the teams, where they strategize, give pep talks. Let's go check in and see what they're up to. There is a lot of nervous energy. You can really feel the tension in that room. There's now a crowd that is starting to form. And this team flew from St. Louis to Hong Kong, and it really comes down to this moment. It's something that you have to sacrifice to do, right, if you want to be the best in anything. The competition here is truly global. Maryville is in Hong Kong representing North America. Their first game is against a team from the University of Porto representing the European Union. 
you just really need to get in the zone. It's a very mental game. When something happens and you can like feel it, you know, you can feel it in the ground. 45 tense minutes later, Andrew and his team beat the team from Portugal. Congratulations, you Thank guys you. did it. How does it feel? Feels good. We barely, we made it out of groups, so we're going on the next stage. That's the first thing I do after a game, is I go and just drink a ton of water. The atmosphere is electric. Tens of thousands of spectators filled the Hong Kong Convention Center over the weekend, and researchers say this is only the beginning. About 454 million people are expected to watch esports this year. That's projected to grow by almost another 200 million in just three years. And 57% of esports' biggest enthusiasts are located right here in the Asia Pacific region. It all roots down to competition. It's not like the game result all the time that matters, it's usually what surrounds it, you know, the passion, the energy. The demand for esports is growing so quickly, industry insiders are worried about a talent shortage. Unlike traditional sports, esports doesn't have a formal pipeline for turning amateurs into professionals. That bottleneck could even slow down the field's explosive growth. But some are seizing the opportunity. The Chinese Ministry of Education has added esports and gaming into its postgraduate and vocational curriculum. That means you can now take esports as a major at some Chinese schools. And indeed, that's how Andrew and his team met their match. The Maryville team made it to the final round of the tournament, but ended up coming in second place to the winning team from China. <laughs> It was a great experience. We got to come out to Hong Kong. We got to play against other schools. It was cool to see that we're second in the world. It was my last game as well. Um, surprisingly, I don't, I don't really feel that yet. And when I go back home and I'm starting like switching up my life and my career, I'll definitely, when I'll start to think about it. I did this for seven or eight years, had my run. Andrew is now becoming an assistant director and coach where he wants to further the popularity of esports around the world, especially in colleges. Think of him as an esports evangelist. I'm one of the very first people to receive a full ride scholarship, I think fully covered for four years and graduate. It's gotta be cool to say, you know, in 20, 30 years, right, that I was one of the people to really shape this landscape. Because technology evolves, and I think as more people have access to internet and computers, we're gonna see esports grow to something that the world has never seen. Hey guys, it's Upton. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about esports at this festival. Do you think it will continue to grow? Let us know in the comments below. Check out more videos, and while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time. CNBC Sports, brought to you by the Hong Kong Tourism Board.